I think some folks are dying to ask a few questions. I have the mic here so you can ask. Hey. Um, yeah, why don't you come up? Brother Plump, I uh, just want to, well, thank you all for uh, such inspiring conversation uh, in many ways uh, for a young black artist and uh, teacher. It's, it's a great opportunity to hear things that are not written down that are from people who lived them. So thank you very much. Um, I, I do have a question about uh, class. Um, thank you so much, Brother Plump, too, for the, the comment about gender and sexuality and mm -hmm. kind of race, like who people slept with is something that is often talked about on the low but never articulated by our leaders. Um, but class, right now, let's say, and, and this is also to your point, Carolyn, that uh, you guys are all college educated. You were all attempting to do, you were bumping up. You had your bourgeois apartment. Uh, but there seemed to have been a, more of a connection. There seemed to have been more of a connection between uh, people in uh, the black power movement and their connection to the poor uh, more than sometimes I feel today folk who have are college educated and maybe have a master's or the, the further they move up the, the scale, uh, the, there's a greater disconnect between them and communities that they talk about. I'd like you guys to give, give word to um, the relationship between uh, education and class and the communities that you served at, at that time. Well, I just wanted to say very quickly, that's not where I I came from, I always used to say this, and if you read my work, you'll find it. I came from 47th Street. Mm -hmm. I used to walk up and down 47th Street, and then 407 Club was on the corner of uh, 47th and Evans. And I used to walk past there and hear uh, Muddy, Blue, Muddy Waters and uh, Guitar Slim and um, Bobby Blue Bland singing. And that was my frame of reference. We, we lived in a place where um, I wrote my poem for our fathers, where my father put down uh, poison for rats. Uh, we had rats, and we, we lived poor. My family immigrated from the South. They came here, like many families, looking for a better place. They wanted education for their children. So when you talk about class, you're talking about, it, it's, it's sociological, but my parents did the thing for our, their children that they could not do for themselves. They had their children educated. So I acquired a certain, you might say, I moved into a class. My, my parents couldn't get there. My mother couldn't afford college. She cried about it all the time, that she never could afford to go to college. My father couldn't finish high school. So they wanted their children to. So when you talk about that, I have now a master's degree. Okay, and I did get a bougie apartment, but that wasn't where I came from. When I started writing, I talked, the things I talked about were things that people knew of. We, I never knew that neck bones and greens were, were uh, a food that was for poor people and beans and stuff like that. I, this is something I loved, we ate it, but we were poor. And it's a shame in the sense because we always felt in Obasi that we had to give our poor credentials. I mean that <laughs> we did because uh, Haki would always say he was raised in Detroit where uh, Diana Ross was and he lived in a, um, a housing complex. He was poor and people would come in and they would do this. It's okay because at some point people begin to see us as the credentials that we have acquired. And sometimes we tend to put that forth because, as I said, you, you, you feel like a piece of meat in, in America. You've got to have your label stamped on USDA, you know, and you're then approved and you can enter through certain doors that they allow. But one of the things we, we decided we would do was to forget where we came from and to forget what our parents suffered, the bridge, to get us through, to get us over to that. So I think I'm speaking to what you were. Thank you very much. Yeah. yeah. Obasi did address the, the issue uh, of the poor directly. Uh, somewhere around 71 or 72, we found a children's workshop where all of the children from either what, Robert Taylor Homes, or Stateway Gardens, 
uh, identified uh, a school teacher, and we were strong on the literacy end um, and very reserved in telling them anything about what to write about or how to write it. We had uh, parties for them. Uh, one of the young women is a lawyer. Uh, now, so, so, so that was, I mean, uh, we also had a policy, uh, if they wanted any book, they could take from the library as long as they told us they would read it. Uh, we, were, we was right in the heart, uh, this is before the gap became the big issue. Uh, you know, you know where the gap is at? Uh, in Chicago from 35th Street maybe back down to 30th Street from King Drive, maybe over to State Street. We were right in that area, and that was uh, addressed. The, the, the other issue that we dealt with often, uh, the Black Panthers, and I can't get the names, I have the faces. More than one time, they did uh, come to the writer's workshop. And, and part of the rhetoric, not between us and them, was that if you are a cultural nationalist, you were, the, you were a poke chop nationalist. <laughs> uh, no, no. Uh, and that, that, that in order to be a revolutionary nationalist, you had to organize the masses uh, of the people and I can remember more than once uh, uh, what Fuller said, the only thing he was trying to do is to organize them so they could learn how to write. You know, uh, so, 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 so it was addressed. Now people such as Sam Greenlee uh, uh, actually went into the community and went into bars and uh, set up poetry readings. So that, 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 that was outreach uh, uh, there. Uh, Obasi was not an organization where the writers were quote unquote stars outside of the community. You know, much of what you gained as a star was right inside of that community. I have a comment. What makes you think I have money now? <laughs> 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 I have an education, <laughs> a very expensive one, <laughs> but having an education doesn't mean that you automatically have a lot of money, especially if you're an artist, a serious writer. You know? I also <laughs> wanted to um, suggest that the uh, part of the what pushed um, the Congress of African People to the left was the um, the the kind of backward views, political views that you could have about women um, as cultural nationalists, and um, it, if um, Baraka walked into a party in 1972 with Amina 15 steps behind, it wasn't long after that party before Amina would have moved those simbas out of the way and stepped up front. It was the women in the Congress of African People who forced the Congress of African People to deal with this narrow nationalism and especially as it regarded uh, women. Um, so uh, there were a lot of twists and turns, um, ideological twists and turns in the movement and I think the advice that we got from Sterling that we should study these twists and turns closely um, is, what, is, is advice that we should take. Um, I had a question on a uh, specific participant. Sterling Plump mentioned um, Hoyt Fuller several times, and, and all of you uh, regard him as either influential in your own work or in the movement at large. And so I was wondering, um, Sterling Plump brought up sexuality in the black arts movement, and I was wondering, considering Fuller's uh, sexuality, how, how exactly was that received within the movement? Because even though he's, um, he's like the editor of Black World, he's doing all these amazing things, he was also at this time known as being homosexual, if I'm correct. How did that play into the black arts movement? It's kind of, it almost seems like a contradiction with the, but how, in your opinion, how, how did that work? I don't think he was known as being homosexual. Yeah. Well, I, 
Let me, let me, let me. Let me. Everybody no, 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 let me. No. <laughs> let me address it this way. I think that what you know is from your personal experience. And Hoyt had helped me, and I had a lot of respect. There were only two people from the Black Arts Movement that I supported from the beginning till the end. One is Haki Mabuti. There was never a time uh, that I would not give him money, and it's not because I believe that he is ideologically correct. I'm convinced that he's sincere. Now, now with Hort Fuller, it's very urbane, and I can remember once, and I assume he was coming from Northwestern. Uh, I, at the time, you used to be able to sit in places like Walgreens and in the cafeteria for hours and hours and read. And so here I am sitting, and in my about my second or third hour, I see a Nord, Nordic looking white gentleman come and go in the direction of the bathroom. Don't pay any attention to him. And reading, doing whatever I'm ran, and somewhat later I saw him leave. And Hoyt Fuller left after him. Now, he caught my eye and I ran and caught him and took him to dinner and told him that if he could live with his lifestyle, I could live happily with it. You know, and had nothing to say to anyone because I think that uh, I always told my students uh, at the URC, and I tell you now, I support sexual choice, right? Until, you be, until your choice becomes the woman I'm with. <laughs> you know, and then, and then I become somewhat reserved. I mean, uh, like, no, 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 but, but, but see, Hoyt's a very sophisticated man. It's not like uh, Hoyt, I don't know. See, some people almost have a myth statue. Uh, uh, I noticed that in South Africa, people were not debating directly with Mandela. We, as young writers, loved Hoyt Fuller. We saw no way, no way uh, how he discriminated against us. Uh, I mean, if, you, if I, I mean, I said things to him about not publishing writers I thought should be published, and he told me that was my opinion. I mean, it was not, it was not like I mean, I told him a lot of time I think you should have published so and so and so and so, and he told me I wasn't editor to a black world. <laughs> so he was not like a stranger. You know, you know, he didn't have a stranger relationship. You, 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 you see what I'm, what I'm trying to say? He was not imposing anything. Let me put it that way. I wanted to speak to that because um, it was, it's important. When I, when I first found out, and I just assumed everyone knew it, I found out something. I think it opened up my consciousness as a young woman. He was loved by a lot of people. I mean, he was hated by a lot of people because he, he, um, he ruled the Obasi workshop with an iron hand. He had certain things that he wanted us to learn. He, there were certain things that he wanted us to do. He wanted us to write. He wanted us to be good writers. He wanted us to develop. He wanted us to read. He wanted us to meet our literary predecessors. And he was, he was stern and he was uh, tough about it. He wanted us to develop. He wanted us to carry on a literary tradition. And what I found out was that most people loved him. They didn't care about Hoyt. He didn't, he didn't wave it around in your face. He was discreet. He uh, he posed. He was the he was a model on the back of Negro Digest Black World for years and years and years. And 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 he was, as you said, a little bit vain. He was a nice looking black man, you know. And he didn't he play that nice. down in any way. He dressed a certain way. You could just love him. You just I, I I really felt that he carried himself in a way that was above and beyond reproach. Yeah. He was debonair and handsome, that's what he was. Yes, he was very handsome. And yeah. I talked to Hoyt Fuller two or three times a week after he moved to Atlanta. We were very close. 
and we never talked about his personal business. And uh, I don't think if, if you, people say that he was homosexual, I think bisexual is more accurate. If you want to get in people's bedrooms. If you want to get into their business. If you want to get into their business. <laughs> but I think that the issue that you raise is an important issue that goes beyond Hoyt. Um, there are other writers um, and artists of the black arts movement um, that at some point or another have come to be known uh, to be gay. And I think that that forces us to deal with our own political views about uh, homophobia and, um, and forces us to look at the contribution that they made irrespective of their sexual um, preferences. Um, and I think that when you look at James Baldwin and uh, Langston Hughes and others who are said to be gay, I don't, I don't think that you'll be able to find that their sexual preference compromise their contribution to the black arts movement. It's really gratifying to hear all of the stories today. And as someone of a certain age who was involved in some of the Free South Africa work and uh, can remember how the women did all of the committee work <laughs> mm -hmm. and wrote all the press releases and organized everything and then always put the guy's name at the front. And I remember saying, why is that? But there was a sense uh, at the time that we get liberation for you know Mozambique and the frontline states and South Africa first and then worry about these other issues later. I never agreed to that. But other people did, so Sterling, it's, it's really um, gratifying to hear you talk about those issues. But you had mentioned before, um, Mr. Undine, that you would see this as a, a turning point when the black liberation movement and the black arts movement has a resurgence. Who do you all see as the next generation um, helping to make that? I know that you have students and others who are on the forefront. But who do you see uh, doing positive work that we can look to for the future? Well, I think it's similar to what we would have seen early 1966. Most of what, or 65, around that time, most of what you would have seen would have not been any national figures, but local figures, people in their own hometowns doing a lot of work. But I'll tell you something that would be interesting to study for some of you brilliant research types. Um, I think it would be interesting for you to study the next generation of young African American men and women who are the sons and daughters and nieces and nephews of this generation. I think they're out there doing some fantastic things, and they will probably be the ones who will convene the next national structure, including my son. Uh, I'd like to speak to uh, young brother back there and sister over here who raised a question about uh, homosexuality and uh, class. Uh, the class divisions that we see today and the homophobia that we see today are recent phenomena and not a great deal older than the two of you. First of all, when I grew up, there was no question about uh, affluent blacks identifying with uh, poor blacks because they lived right next door. Mm -hmm. You see, because the ghetto was restricted by severe uh, property lines and Affluent blacks had no choice except to live among the black poor. And it was a, a, a fantastic time to be uh, poor and black or affluent and black because it was almost utopian in the sense that blacks uh, communicated across class lines. Uh, the class division that you see today is being delineated by people like Bill Cosby and others, uh, didn't exist when I grew up. Uh, homophobia is a recent phenomenon, particularly among the, the rappers, and uh, many of them are in denial. 
Because they're fresh out of the joint, what you think they were doing when they were in there. <laughs> All right? And they better not go back because Bubba's probably mad at it. <laughs> so so uh, we didn't care. Furthermore, uh, homosexuals are intrinsic, particularly in the church. Many of the directors of, of the uh, choruses were openly gay. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And black homosexuals didn't have to form their own churches. They were more than welcome in the church. The old phenomenon was hate the sin, but not the sin. And they felt that God loved uh, gay people like they uh, loved everybody else. Uh, it's the kind of uh, Christian love that at our best we represent as a people. So the questions that you raised and you raised, which are both valid today, were irrelevant when I was growing up, when I was your age. 